Right. Good afternoon, everybody. Here we are, Tony Miller and Paper Cousins, ready to chat to you. So we'll uh, give it a few minutes before we launch in, before, give a few people a chance to join us. Yep. Lovely. Mm -hmm. and Hello, uh, Facebook world. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, hello, Serpa world. Whether yes. you're a practitioner or a patient or somebody just trying to find out about it, then uh, we're really happy that you're here. And at any point, if you want to ask us any questions, please put them in the chat box and we will endeavour to answer them the best that we can. Yes. So, if, Tom, if, if you don't ask any questions, then you'll just have to listen to us. And apparently we can talk the hind legs off a donkey, according to Georgie. <laughs> Which we plan to do, so uh, you're welcome to listen to us do that. Tanya, do you want to just say um, a little bit about yourself and where you are and what you do and how you got into this, just as an introduction? Yeah, uh, so my name is Tanya Miller. Um, I'm a McTimony chiropractor. Um, I've been practising since 2009, and I came across the SERPA work in 2008 15 when I saw a talk by Georgie and I signed up and did uh, the course I was lucky enough that um, I did the live course the real Georgie um, and I've been mixing that in with my clinical practice ever since then excellent and I'm Pippa Cousins I am a registered osteopath and a SERPA trained practitioner as well and I'm based in East Sussex and I discovered the SERPA approach at conference um, in 2017, when I myself was struggling with fibromyalgia, and it was a sort of life changing moment, both professionally and personally for me at that point. And um, it has certainly changed my life and I am now, well, probably 99% pain free most of the time. So uh, that's a little bit more about us. Talking of conference, we had a we had a lovely time, didn't we, at the conference, the Serpa conference, yeah. a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, what a blast! There's some brilliant speakers, and and I mean the the theme was research, wasn't it? And Absolutely. and it's so because it, it's so lovely to see so much research being done and and people getting involved and the whole idea of of our our emotions and pain. Um, the connection um, to see it progressing. Um, yes, that. and I think what was really nice too is that the speakers came from uh, different backgrounds. Um, there was uh, there were doctors, um, there were um, there was a physio, there was a clinical psychologist, and it is really about that whole approach from all sides that is really what makes this uh, you know this work this work work really if we look at it from that biopsychosocial perspective from the mind and the body and tie the two together then um it really does make a difference to people's pain uh, pictures it was lovely to see um the recovery story as well wasn't it um he, yes. he was not moved by her story yes absolutely there was a beautiful recovery story um from actually um uh, a, a lady called Fiona Symington who grew up in the same village as I did and I well remembered because <laughs> yeah well she her parents and my parents are friends so we, we sort of we oh, do know each other okay. and um the film was made by um a, a platform called Living Proof who have made now two very very beautiful films one about um, a chronic pain recovery story and one about uh, recovery from chronic fatigue ME. Um, so mm -hmm. they are both on YouTube actually if you um, want to have a look on there. So if you look up Living Proof recovery stories on YouTube I think you should be able to find them and, and they're definitely worth watching. I would highly recommend it. It was really moving to, to watch her story, to watch the video and actually then to have her there um, and her emotion and how much has changed her life it was superb and I think that's so true I mean I certainly feel that in my own story um you know we I know we spoke before and we spoke I can't remember if we spoke just before or just after I did my monumental trek in the summer but it was just after wasn't it was it just after? yeah but yeah no, so for me again it's that same thing so five years ago I couldn't walk my dogs around the block and this summer I climbed Britain's three highest peaks and in that moment five years ago 
I had no idea if I was ever going to get off the sofa again. And I think that's why this SERPA approach is so life-changing. And I, if you want um, more recovery stories, actually, there are a lot of recovery stories on the SERPA site, so SERPA.org. And they they come from people with different types of pain. So they, they're not all low back pain. Some might be sort of sciatica. Some might have been headaches, uh, pelvic pain, different areas. So you may well find a story that aligns with something that you're experiencing. And actually, it's really nice to hear how somebody else recovers. And we were going to talk a bit today, Tanya, weren't we, about how we sort of integrate that into our practices and what it kind of looks like and how how we go about helping people in that way. Well, I, I thought that might be useful because not everybody is going to do um, all of the journaling and meditation and things that we suggest. Um, but there's still ways, as you're an osteopath, I'm a chiropractor, there's still ways that we can help people and at least not give them misinformation for a start and tell them that if you don't get this fixed, you're going to be paralysed or whatever. But there's lots of really useful things like um, I had a, a client who had a lot of a discomfort in his upper back and sometimes it was prone to going into spasm. Um, and I taught him not to poke the bear, which is basically leave it alone. I mean, I've had upper back pain myself years and years ago. Um, and you kind of, especially as you're a therapist, you keep, oh, I'm just going to massage it. I'm just going to flick it. I'm just going to see what I can do. But what that does is it draws more attention to it and it makes it worse. Because if you haven't got any discomfort, you start poking it and you think, oh, actually, it's a bit tight there and it's uncomfortable. And this, I taught this client to do that. And he said, you know, that's the best thing I've ever learned. And, and he's just, he's a chiropractic client. He doesn't go and journal and things. And he's got stress in his life. But just stopping poking that better um, is massive for him. And, and somebody else did the same. He's, they said, oh, yes, well, I'm always like checking to see if it still hurts. <laughs> <laughs> well, it will if you keep poking it. <laughs> and it's also the body is sensitized often with chronic pain conditions. So actually you can almost press anywhere and it hurts. Yeah. And I think one of the big messages that we give again our osteopathic clients, whether they're sort of SERPA or not, is that actually, um, you know, the, well, certainly the body can feel pain without there being any damage. And actually I was taught a technique by, I think it was Tim Beams, who is part of the uh, Neuro Orthopedic Institution. And I did their Explain Pain course. And he, in the tie in the in one part of the course, said, well, I want everybody to squeeze their earlobe. And of course, we, you know, no, squeeze your earlobe really hard. And you squeeze your earlobe really hard and it really, really hurts. And then you stop squeezing your earlobe and actually not <laughs> stay hurting or it stops hurting. But actually you haven't done any damage. And, and I think sometimes that's a, quite a good way of saying to people, actually, you can have pain, but there doesn't have to be damage. Mm. And like you say, it's really important for people to, to learn that and to not keep prodding the bear. Funny enough, actually this week, I had a client who I've been working with for a little while and he's, um, I think probably 10, I haven't been working for him with him for 10 years, but he's had pain for 10 years. And we had an interesting experience yesterday where he, we were talking about somatic tracking or somatic experiencing, mm -hmm. which is essentially a technique where you follow the pain in the body and you just observe it sort of with curiosity. And you just kind of see what it is, but without analysing it, without going, well, I wonder what that is, or I wonder what's causing that, or I wonder if that's going to, you know, cause me damage, or if it's going to stop me doing this. It's about sitting there with it and going, well, I wonder what that is. And it's okay. It's just a sensation and letting yourself know that it's okay. And we had a very interesting, um, we had a very interesting session where the pain basically started at his head and it went down the left-hand side of his body. And each time it reached a new place, we just sat with it and, and acknowledged it. And then it moved on to somewhere else. And he was interesting because he's a real striver and he was really, he wants to make his pain better, which so many of us do. But what he was, so when I said, well, you know, it's about just accepting that pain in the moment. And he was like, well, I don't, I don't want to accept it. I've, I've got to fight to make it better. It's like, actually, sometimes we've just got to slow down and we've just got to stop and we've just got to acknowledge it and actually take the fear out of it. And yeah. um, the analogy I came up with yesterday that I, I quite liked was it's a bit like you can the fear. If you think of the fear like a thunder, if you think of the pain and the fear like a child watching a thunderstorm, a child is really frightened and the thunderstorm is really real. 
And that's the same with the pain. The pain is real. It's not that you're imagining it, but actually how you react to it is important. So if you can imagine when you've got pain that you're comforting a small child in a thunderstorm and going, it's okay, it's a thunderstorm, but you're going to be all right. It is, yes, we can hear it and we can see it and we can feel it, but it's going to be okay. Actually, that starts to quieten our nervous system down and and can reduce the amount of pain that we're experiencing. Mm. Something else that um, could be helpful is um, asking people if it makes sense that they've got pain. Because sometimes, I don't know about you, but you get people come in and say, it doesn't make sense. I was I wasn't doing much. I just got out of the car. Um, or uh, one of our classics is we get, um, well, I must have slept wrong. But does that make sense? Have you slept safely for the last 40 years? And I, I often tell them about when I went skiing one time and I fell over and I wrenched my arm right back like that. And I thought, oh, <laughs> this is going to be bad. And I had no pain whatsoever. It didn't, not even a muscle pull. So if you can do something like that and not get an injury, like why would you wake up with pain that just came on in the night? Um, and sleeping is a quite safe occupation generally, isn't it? So it's, getting people to question it, whether it makes sense, I think is a good thing to do too. Absolutely. And I think sleep only, um, sleep, we do a lot of processing in <laughs> though and I think that's why often people wake up in the morning feeling very tense or in pain or very stiff because actually overnight they've been very very busy processing the day before or whatever's going on in their life at that time and we uh, recommend to people actually we won't we won't I know we weren't going to mention journaling but I you know I can't not no I didn't Um, say you couldn't mention journaling (laughs) (laughs) so we what we tend to say to people is actually the evening before, not just before bed, because I think sometimes that can, you know, make it a bit busy and a bit stirred up. But actually, if you can offload the day, anything that you're worried about, anything that was great, you know, process the day before. And also, I always recommend people do that with a second list, which is what they need to do the next day. So you don't go to bed thinking, oh, my God, I mustn't forget to pick up so you know, my child's shoes from the menders or whatever it happens to be. And you then mean that you, when you go to bed, you're you're more settled and, and you're doing less of that sub, you know, subconscious sort of processing that can mean that we end up very tense. Yeah. And I think if you if we start to ask people, well, does it make sense that you got that pain for seemingly no reason because you didn't do an injury, then you can start to say, well, how tight do you think your muscles are? What what are your stresses? What is the tension in your life? What is the pressures um, that you might be under? that sort of thing and then maybe that makes more sense yes we often talk since when I from being being an osteopath and then doing my SERPA training on top we added a few questions to the case history that um, make a difference we now ask many more sort of lifestyle questions so you know do Mm -hmm. you um, sleep have you got fatigue do you have any anxiety is there you know anything stressful going on in your life at the moment those sorts of questions too But also, I think one of the most important questions is asking people what else was going on when their symptoms first arise, Mm. first came about. Because essentially, it's like if you you can often attribute it to a physical thing. Oh, I lifted a box. But actually, you might have lifted that box, like you say, every day for the last 20 years and it hasn't been a problem. So what was different that day? oh, actually, you know, in the week before that, we'd, we'd moved house, you know, or, or, you know, actually one of the children was sick or, you know, we're worried about the bills or whatever it happens to be. And I think, so it's just that asking that extra, you know, what else was going on? And often people then go, oh, you know, actually, well, we were doing this at the time. And it, and it just starts to make those connections as to, you know, again, trying to let people know that they can have pain, but it doesn't have to relate to tissue damage. Yeah, I, I think it's important for us as practitioners to um, try and encourage them that their bodies are resilient Um, and because I think it's always a shame if people say well I don't do this anymore because of x y and z and and they're fearful it it comes from fear doesn't it Um, and it's important to to keep reinforcing that their bodies are strong and resilient and I think too and I think those of bearing in mind we're both physical therapists I think, you know, some of our colleagues and and myself until I had this knowledge, actually, 
we were possibly worrying people too like oh you've yeah. done a you know you've done a ligament or you've got a you know this that or the other and actually oh you know don't do this or do do that or only do this or if it hurts don't do that and i think like you say it's really important to um help people understand that they can do these things safely and with reassurance really you know start small you yeah. know don't overdo it and actually just keep telling yourself that your body is strong it's safe it's well it's you know it's robust because it really is yeah I, I had a chap who hadn't he came with back pain he hadn't been able to lie on his back for years and I think that was born out of fear um, and he does even when his back hurts he can now lie on his back yeah yeah and I think I think the thing is is it's interesting too because we talk about it as if it's just easy to separate the fear from the pain, and I think it's really that can be quite challenging and unless you've got perhaps somebody helping you or you've got one mm -hmm. of the books to help you understand because we we tend to run these patterns and our body gets oh my goodness and and pain is 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 sort of meant to be a dangerous thing if that makes sense it's meant to stop us doing things yeah. that are more dangerous so absolutely we don't want to do them but it, it's when the body gets stuck in that pattern and we know that often a injury has healed but yet it stayed with the pain pattern so normal tissue healing normally occurs within three months and actually so if the pain persists beyond that then usually everything is actually mended but the body has got stuck in the in the concern surrounding it well before i came across this work i was a treatment junkie i i would have treatment every four weeks or so whether it be chiropractic or massage or reflexology reflexology i still have because it's, it's nice and relaxing but i would i needed it i don't need it now but i needed that a, a fix um and I used to think, well, you know, I accept it as part of the job, or um, and but I, I accepted it as normal. I didn't think there was anything wrong. It was just, well, you know, that's that's my back. Um, I don't accept that anymore, and I try and encourage other people not to. No, and I now actually the biggest difference for me now is if I have pain, like you say, I will then I'll actually sit down and reflect on it. I'll sit down and kind of go. Well, what's that about? And and very often it's about something completely unrelated to anything physical. It's just a worry that's you know that's popped up and I haven't addressed it. And I and I think it is a it can be quite a big leap to get that. You know how can I, when I've had back pain for ten years and by changing my thoughts am I going to change my back? It, well, it does work, and it's also not. I think it's so important to, to for people to know that this is not you're not imagining the pain, the pain is absolutely there and it's being produced by these neural pathways that have got stuck. They've got stuck in the on position. And it, as I say, sometimes by becoming aware of what we talk in our, in our practice about a backpack model, it's like, what's in your backpack? You know, what, what are you carrying, whether that's physical or emotional? Um, it's like, what, what's weighing you down? And sometimes that's a, actually a practical thing, like you're doing too much. Actually, we might recommend that, you you know, could you actually get somebody to take the kids to dancing so that you could have five minutes off? Or it's a, a more emotional thing where, you know, you've been very upset by something that has happened in your life in the last, you know, few weeks or few months. Um, as I say, we we use a sort of we have actually have a sort of a worksheet with a backpack on it and you can write in all the things that might be bothering you and then you can decide what you can unpick and what you can't. There's something I, I've seen quite commonly um, an issue in, in women um, who are just getting frustrated <laughs> because they're the ones that do all the cooking and, and several people I've managed to get encourage them to like start doing a bit of a schedule so that other people in the house make the meals but that they are prepared to just have beans on toast um if the other people haven't done it and that's made a huge impact for them yeah because they were just getting so frustrated and so angry with the other people in the house well no one ever else no one else ever does it and just making that small change um made a huge amount of difference and i had one of them it was lovely she came in and said we've had beans on toast three times this week <laughs> <laughs> and the other two nights we had beans on jacket potato yeah. <laughs> but she didn't have back pain yeah and it, yeah. it just some, sometimes it's these simple sort of things you know I, I think too sometimes it's about 
kind of choosing the battles, isn't it? It's about choosing the things that are important and to, to fight and put energy and effort into and that, you know, are okay for your nervous system and, and the things that actually really, really agitate your system. And you think, I really shouldn't be doing this to myself. When I got to the point where with my pain, I had a great deal of anxiety and I felt very overwhelmed and I felt very, very fizzy. And actually, I when I got better um, and I had a less of that, what I found was that th when I then started to do something that pushed me back into that place where I didn't feel comfortable again, because I could kind of listen to it and, and feel it better, I then thought, actually, that's the thing I'm not supposed to be doing. So it is, again, coming back to that listening to our bodies, not just listening to thoughts in our minds that are telling us that we must do this, that and the other. Mm. It's about listening to our bodies. Definitely. And so what do you, if you have people in your clinic um, and they say to you, they come to you as an osteopath. Yeah. And they say, why have I got this pain? Why is this happening? What's your, what's your kind of answer that you use? I think it obviously the, it depends on why they've come in. But if we're talking about a patient who's come in, you know, with a, with a persistent pain situation, a chronic pain situation that's been there for a long while, um, I would certainly, I think, when we take our case history, we explain that, you know, not pain is not always related to injury or to tissue damage. Um, it can be related to the way that the nervous system is, is functioning. And then as we ask more questions about what, um, you know, what else is, as I say, going on in their life currently or what may have been stressful situations in their past, even as far back as childhood, then we start to get a picture of whether we're dealing with something that is just I, I was going to say purely musculoskeletal, but actually, I, I don't think I'd ever use that term anymore. I don't think we ever have anything purely musculoskeletal anymore. But it is that looking at it and saying, well, you know, definitely what we feel is that there's a tension in the muscle. There's definitely tightness and it and, and we feel that and the body doesn't feel like it's relaxing and it feels very compressed. But we know that the cause of that is not necessarily coming from the muscles. It's coming from the nervous system. So it's like this neuromuscular thing. So we then say, you know, there is a lot of understanding now about the fact that actually pain can be being produced by the nervous system. And we then explore what else might be going on, as I say, that might be relevant. Mm. How about yourself? Is there a particular way you address it? I tend to like, as a, as a short version, I say life. <laughs> <laughs> life happens to our bodies is my quick answer I mean obviously if there's a little bit more going on and they come in as a new client um, and you can see that there's some stress issues or I might mention well have you thought about them that might be connected but if it's someone that I've seen before and they're not really open to anything in the mind body direction I might just say life happens to our bodies and we hold tension in the body um, what I can't say anymore is, well, you've got a very wonky pelvis and they're probably you sat down too long or you've been driving too long. And I can't, I can't do that because it doesn't feel authentic. No, and, and as we've said, the body's actually really robust. And when you were saying that, oh, you know, your leg's too long, you mustn't drive. It's like that thing of like driving with your wallet in your back pocket. Yeah. Driving yeah. with your pocket is producing rotation in your pelvis. And, and, you know it's it's conceivable that it may be an irritant and a trigger but actually it's I think it, you know our body's incredibly robust you know you could probably sit rotated on a chair all day if you weren't sort of stressed by the fact you're having to drive from one end of the country to another for your job or whatever it happens to be yeah yeah I remember someone saying well I think it's the position I'm sitting at when I'm at my laptop because I sit cross-legged on the floor and what it turned out that they were actually working from like six o'clock in the morning to one o'clock the following morning and I said I think it might be how long you're sad doing that for mm. uh, so yeah has anybody has anybody got any questions we're very happy to answer very specific well we hope we can answer very specific questions as I say do pop them in the in the chat box um or the comment box underneath if you'd like to to ask us anything have we got yes. some people listening in Pippa we certainly have got some people listening in either that or they've just plugged <clears> us <throat> in and they've walked away I'm not sure but we're <laughs> hoping that we haven't frightened them away at this point so we um I think as I say for me <clears throat> the, we certainly we have a lot of patients who come to us still as 
um, <clears throat> osteopathic patients, if that makes sense, rather than surfer patients or mind-body patients or chronic pain patients. But actually, what we're finding is that whereas you would talk about, as I say, a chronic pain condition having been there for more than three months, we're actually seeing people coming in who've perhaps only had pain for two or three weeks. But actually, when we ask them the same questions as we would ask somebody in a chronic pain scenario, actually, the factors are still the same. They're still saying, mm-hmm. actually, gosh, my, um, uh, my, you know, my, my mother's ill or I had to rush to help my aunt the other day and actually my child's been sick. And, it, and, it, and the factors are the same. So we can then still say, actually, you know, it seems like your, um, your body may be under a little bit of pressure because, you know, you've got a lot going on. And I, I think, you know, particularly in, at the moment in the world, it's, you know, it's been a stressful few years. And I think we're all at a level of sort of tension and pressure that, you know, we've probably not experienced for this prolonged period before. And I think that's definitely influencing people. I think we have an opportunity in the job that we do as manual therapists, because that's quite often a first point of call for people, like you say, who've only been in pain for a short time. And we've got the opportunity to give a little bit of education there um, give them some treatment. They'll probably feel better for it, um, but also give them some managing techniques um, for themselves um, and not give them any misinformation. Yes, and I think, and, and uh, for me, that's particularly about making sure that we don't have any scary language. Um, you know, that mm. we, one of the ladies who told her recovery story, the other lady who told her recovery story at the conference was saying, I think that, a, you know, a, I can't remember the exact description she said that an osteopath had told her that her St. Coriliac joint was, I can't remember, she said wobbling all over the place and that she mustn't. <laughs> She mustn't do, you know, if you know if it hurts to not do anything. And I, you know, I cringed on the inside because, you know, I'm possibly I might have said that, you know, ten years ago. Yeah. But but I I think, um, you know, we have to be very cautious about our language. And I think it's um, the, you know, the, that that's so important. It's so so important that we can help to reassure people. We've had a couple of comments, uh, Tanya, that I wish okay. to poor, poor, poor Tanya's in the dark. She can't see the text. <laughs> and, you know, I can just give her a little bit. So um, thank you very much, Joy. It says your chat seems to be answering all the questions. Thank you. So thank you. And Tamsin has said, finding your descriptions and discussion were very helpful. Thank you. Well, it's our pleasure. And Sarah has said, thank you for this session. What were Pippa's first steps on her recovery journey? Oh, yes, um, let's hear about your journey. <laughs> yes, so, um, my um, my recovery journey. It was interesting. So there there are people who read um, the books on the mind body um, uh, approach and almost get instantly better. It's rare. Don't you know? It's not something that's necessarily going to happen. But there are people who sort of you know read one of. Uh, John Sarno's books like The Mind Body Prescription or Georgie's book, Chronic Pain, Your Key to Recovery. And actually, they then feel like a whole load better. Very, very, you know, the pain dissipates very quickly. Now, mine wasn't quite the same. But having said that, the day after the Surfer Conference in 2017, I had a pain free day. Mm-hmm. And it was like, oh my God. <laughs> it's a miracle. It's a miracle. I thank God. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we're yeah, exactly. Uh, but it was so it was, it was an interesting thing where um, it definitely, um, I think, because something had sunk in, something was like, oh my god, people actually understand what I'm going through. They can give it a name, they can give it a label, they understand the science, and they know how to make it better. And I think that gave me hope. And I think hope is an incredibly important part of this journey. In fact, it it came up at the weekend at the conference where they were talking about um, the difference between sort of uh, ACT, which is acceptance and commitment therapy, which is where you sort of go, oh, well, you know, I've got pain. I'm going to live with it. I'm going to be all right. I'll make the best of it, um, which has some good management skills in it. But also with, with our approach, which is more pain reprocessing therapy, in that sense of there is hope. We have so much evidence now to show that people can get better. And actually giving that hope to people is really important. And well, obviously the science, but it gives them hope. So I I then tried to get myself better after the conference reading a book. And actually 
What book did you read? I write, I read The Mind Body Prescription by Dr. Sarno. And I investigated online and things like that. And I got a certain way to being better, but I really didn't get better completely. So I actually went to see a SERPA trained practitioner myself and I had six sessions. And in each session, there was definitely like a real penny dropping moment of, you know, something that really resonated. And, and some of that was, I think some of the key things was looking back at, one of the things we do as SERPA practitioners is when we see a, a patient is we, we um, Get you, get you to fill in a questionnaire and essentially it's quite a long questionnaire but it was that one of the things my surf practitioner said to me is well look at how well you're doing because you're still standing and you've been through all of this and that mm. was quite big to me yeah. and, and and I think then also along that journey learning to be kind to myself to be kind of compassionate to myself to understand that quite a lot of the stressful events that happened in my past were not uh, my fault um, and that actually just by striving and pushing through I wasn't going to make them better so there was a deep understanding that came from going through that process with a certain practitioner and it gave me the tools and the techniques to actually not be frightened of my pain and that was huge I came out of the process not frightened it meant I could get back in the pool I could get back walking um, and I knew even if it hurt, I wasn't doing any damage so that was so what, what was your fear that you would do damage or I think so. My pain in my low back literally felt like if I bent over, it felt like the muscles were going to tear off the bone. I mean, it was, you know, and, and as a as a therapist, a physical therapist, you kind of got that. That was the visualization I had. I'm like, if I move, it's going to rip, you know, literally. Mm -hmm. And I've also had been in that situation where I had an MRI scan and I've been told that I got degenerative discs the whole way down my spine, oh. which is to say, yeah, exactly. <laughs> don't, no. come, don't do this. You'll never do that again actually you know it's irrelevant so that was definitely my process and I think like you say life happens and so we still have to work at this you know sometimes some days I'll still journal some days I have to do some visualization sometimes I have to kind of just sit and feel those emotions and kind of go what what is really bothering me and actually when you get it from your subconscious into your conscience by either journaling or visualization somatic tracking you um somatic um sorry emotional awareness you 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 then know what you're dealing with and then you've got a, a plan. We've um, we've had another question here from Laura. Thank you, Laura. It says, can issues non-pain related like chronic fatigue benefit from the same techniques? Absolutely. And the- Fibromyalgia. Yeah, fibromyalgia, but also the chronic fatigue that goes with it. So yeah. I, alongside my pain had, uh, Oversharing, apologies. Um, so <laughs> irritable bowel, irritable bladder, uh, reflux, uh, headaches, TNJ pain, um, plantar fasciitis, hip tendonitis. So it's all, it's a whole encompassing, you know, skin irritability, couldn't control my temperature. So all sorts of things, um, but fatigue particularly and anxiety. Um, and I don't know if you were on the call right at the beginning, uh, Laura, but we were just mentioning the living, um, living proof have just made a beautiful film, a recovery film um, about Fiona Symington's recovery from chronic fatigue ME. Um, so if you went onto YouTube and look up Living Proof uh, recovery stories, um, I think you'll find it there. Or if not, come back to the SERPA page at some point and, and ask and somebody will put the link. In fact, it's probably in the thread on the SERPA page. It's been shared over the last couple of weeks. So you'll probably find it there anyway. So. Any other questions? Mm. Tanya, you didn't you didn't particularly have a persistent pain condition? I had I had lower back pain and I had headaches. Okay. But I didn't <laughs> I didn't think I had like a chronic condition. I just thought, well, headaches, part of life. Um back pain, yeah. Funnily enough, the, the day that I met um Georgie and uh, she did a talk, um and there were some other people that I trained with. Um, one, I did my, um, car, my my chiropractic course. And I remember that one of them, one of my colleagues said, oh, my back's never been so brilliant since I've trained as a chiropractor. And I went, that's really interesting because my back has never been so bad since I trained as a chiropractor. And I know, I understand it now. It wasn't because of 
leaning over the bench and doing things like that. It was because I'm a people pleaser. So I was bending over backwards to try and help all of these people that were asking me for help. And if I was fully booked and somebody needed some help because they're in pain, I'd go, Ooh, okay, well, I'll miss my lunch then. I'll pop you in there or I'll put you in at the end of the clinic And I, when I've already done way too many people. Um, so that was that was me not putting my own needs first. And, oh, it made my back a bit tight. So um, that was, I think, I actually believe that if I hadn't have found this work, I would have burned out. Yeah, I think, I think that's true, though, of a huge number of um, health professionals. And I think um, my uh, wish would be that everybody knows about this work, which is partly why we do these talks. It's, it's to get the information to those people who, uh, those of you that need help recovering yourself. But wouldn't it be amazing if all your medical practitioners also had this knowledge um, and that's why it's so lovely to see so many people at the conference last weekend, because yeah. actually, if at that first port of call, you know, you didn't get put straight on painkillers and you didn't get sent down a route of investigation before somebody had actually asked you all these questions about what's going on in your life. And then, you know, it would be a lot less traumatic for people. And then we wouldn't have to unpick it all mm. later on. That's why that's why I feel that we have a wonderful opportunity in the job that we do to prevent that. Yes, because we can we can just plant a few seeds and not give any misinformation, maybe um, bust a few myths um, and just off they go and they don't turn into that chronic pain patient. Yeah. But I think also um, practitioners like therapists particularly attracts the people pleasers because we want to do nice things. We want to nurture people. We want to care for people. Um, but it does like this job presses our buttons, doesn't it? You know, when yeah. you've got someone who's saying, oh, but I'm in so much pain. Can you not do something for me today? And, oh, I really want to help you. We want we want to push ourselves because they're pushing our buttons. I think that's true. So true, though, in the sense of often people who are experiencing chronic pain are in that same place. They're, they're people who want to help. They're people who want to nurture and care for others. And actually, um, there's that expression about not being able to pour from an empty cup. And yeah. um, there's so many people who are experiencing pain who've got nothing in the tank. So they're giving either giving it all to others or they've just completely run out. I mean, we um, saw a, a patient today who was in that thing. She, you know, she said, how come I got to 50 and I got broken? It's like you didn't get broken. It's just that there's so much going on. And, you know, again, sort of somebody who's self-employed running a business, you know, masses and masses going on, you know, young children, um, you know, sick parents. There's, you know, we're all under a lot of pressure and you, you've got to sometimes stop and, and, and fill your own cup. Um, I don't know if you've seen who, um, let me see who it was, sorry, Laura asked about the uh, fatigue. Um, Serpa, which I presume is our is our glorious leader, Georgie, um, is maybe listening in the background and has posted the link no, really? to the <laughs> chronic fatigue um, recovery story. So that's now in this thread on the comments, um, if you can see them. So. Thank you, Georgie. <laughs> We're presuming it's Georgie. It could be somebody else. But I think it must be <laughs> Uh, sit up, hey. Yeah, no, no, we're not. Really sit in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Has anybody got any more questions? Please, as I say, however random they might seem, or if you want information about books or courses or approaches, or uh, you know, even want to you know ask what you know about a certain you know condition or something, please do do ask if you want to. We that's why we're here. So, um, yeah, yeah. Oh gosh. What else are we going to talk about? Well, going going back to um, therapists and attracting a lot of people pleasers, I think like this is something that could help a lot of therapists because um, because therapists tend to be people pleasers. We know that people pleasers particularly can suffer from chronic pain, and you probably know with lots of your colleagues because I see it in my colleagues, and I knew it was in me. Was that I need I need this help or I, you know, I've got these problems in my body or like can anyone recommend something with this because I've got this problem with my thumbs because I've been doing this work and blah 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 um so yeah, yeah. it's like you say you need we need self-care and and sometimes that it, it doesn't mean that we have to go off and do all of the journaling and think although we're a big fan of that but um <laughs> but if we just look at 
how much are we pushing ourselves and that that goes across like so many um professions doesn't it it's like we're just pushing ourselves and pushing ourselves it's, i mean i used to work with a lot of people um from one particular company where the ethos seemed to be it was a competition to see who could be in the office first and who could work the longest and not surprisingly i was getting lots of people from there so why why do we have to push us i mean i've done it myself and actually i've pulled back over the last couple of months I've gone, do you know what? It doesn't matter if I haven't done that. I'm just going to go and sit in the hot tub <laughs> for 10 I, minutes. I think also, interesting enough, I think it's got worse that as we've come into this more digital age, I think, you know, everything's supposed to be so quick. Everything's supposed to be responded to so fast. You know, um, again, I was talking to a lady this morning and she has um, sons at secondary school and, and she also has... Um, you know, so she has twin boys. And so they're, they're getting, um, she's getting maybe eight emails a day from the school, you know, and, and while she has turned off the notifications on her phone, it's still like she's being bombarded. And it's almost like it's intruding into her world. And we talked a little bit about how to manage that. And social media is the same, you know, it's like, it's like, we might have missed something, we might not have seen something. And you know, it's very well designed to push our buttons and change our dopamine levels. So that I think in the in the modern world, we are being we are being pushed. We've had, we've had a, um, so the film has been posted very kindly. We've had a smiley face from Georgie and um, <laughs> we've had a question from Suzanne, which says, how many sessions would a person need if they went to a CERPA practitioner? I'm a counsellor who's coming out of a four year period of chronic pain, unable to sit, understand the mind body link, but hope was given to me by, hope was given to me from a recent osteopath by recognizing my body is not fragile. I'd love to say there's this many sessions. Um, I had six and that certainly felt like a, uh, I felt like we covered a lot of stuff in that. Some people run programs that are more like 12 sessions. We actually, when we combine it with the osteopathy, tend to sort of see maybe three or four and see how we go and then add. So it's a bit of a how long is a piece of string question, Susan. So I'm sorry not to um, be able to answer that uh, I think yeah, every, kind of everyone's thing. journey is different, isn't it? And I think yeah. um, what I've noticed is that you can do some sessions with a practitioner which supports you and, and guides you. And then um, quite often people seem to go off and they process a lot and they keep doing some of the work. And then perhaps they change some things in their lives and then um, they might come back for a little bit more help or they think, do you know what, I'm I'm good to go or... Um, I found I'm ready for the, the next level or whatever. It, it is a journey. Um, and I mean, if you're talking time wise, I would say months. Yeah. And I think it's and I think also too what what you do is once you've kind of got the basic knowledge and the basic set of skills, you then know what you need at that moment. And it's then if you 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 need a bit more then you might need to go back again so like you say maybe four or six sessions and actually you've kind of been given this amazing toolbox of understanding and tools and techniques and practices um, that will then you know be supporting you and, and you can often as I say move forward yourself but then might need to go back I mean I myself so I tend now not to uh, see my surfer practitioner anymore, but actually I've got my little gang of friends on the surfer board and we, we support one another, uh, which is great. Um, but I also then, you know, sometimes I want to go for a physical treatment. So I will go and see my osteopath because actually it makes me feel relaxed. It makes me feel calm. Um, last year I had um, some uh, issues to deal with. In fact, this year, so earlier this year, I had some dispute issues that I wanted to deal with and I couldn't quite fathom it by myself and actually I, I went to see um, you know a psychologist a psychotherapist and that was fine but I think what you what what you get from the initial SERPA grounding is this amazing ability to hear what you need and feel what you need and understand what you need which is is a is a lifelong gift really and it may be that you need to pop back and see a SERPA practitioner and the SERPA practitioners come from different backgrounds so we as physical therapists as osteopaths we sometimes have somebody who comes to us and their, their sort of psychological need within that and the psychological understanding might need a more psychological therapist. And so actually we might send them to a SERPA practitioner who's got who's a psychotherapist by, by profession. Um, so it's like there is, there's, 
there's differences across the board depending on on what you need yeah be be guided by yourself um and i mean we've been going for i mean i've been going since 2015 and i think you since 2017 yeah. and i think you you just keep learning and there's new levels i mean right now i'm really acknowledging that i'm a bit too busy in my head <laughs> and that i need to step away from youtube <laughs> and talk to pimple popper <laughs> <laughs> And you must only watch the very good living proof films about yeah, pain recovery. Yes, yes, that one, obviously, yes. Obviously that I, one. I, really, like, I mean, that's another problem, isn't it? Is it we can be so addicted to, to our technology and it's good to step back sometimes um, from those things. But I, I always say to people, we're our own journey and it's not that we just do this work for a certain amount of time and then we're done and then we can just be like we were before it's actually learning i've had to learn um my people pleasing causes me an issue um and my little tip for people pleasers out there is if someone asks you to um like oh are you going to do this and you're about to go oh yes oh yeah i'll do that you go i'll just get back to you on that one <laughs> <laughs> because people please so we wouldn't be pleasing everybody and we just and then we get ourselves into situations and you think oh i wish i had said no to this um i have so, a phrase i have a phrase we use for people i say um the best thing to say is i'm really sorry i don't have capacity for that right now <laughs> that's a really people good go, one. Oh my god <laughs> they shut me down <laughs> well, that's it but sorry that, it, might be, it might be something that you want to do so yeah. that's why it's good to kind of, oh, I'll just get back to you on that yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. No, um, so we've got about just over 10 minutes or so to go. So again, don't forget to put your questions in the, well, in have the we, chat. Let's ask them some questions. Like, if we've got any people pleasers or perfectionists out there, or <laughs> you'd like to share what their people pleasing does for them. Have, has anyone out there recognised themselves as a people pleaser? Uh, one of the first blogs I wrote actually was um, not quite people pleasing, but one of the first blogs I wrote was why I had to give up perfectionism to recover from fibromyalgia. <laughs> Do you know what perfectionism does for me? Because I don't have everything perfectly done, but it stops me doing stuff because it's the procrastination side of it. That's, yeah, that's yeah. my problem with it because I procrastinate because I think it's not going to be good enough. Not and actually some enough. of the some of the pressures that we put on ourselves that produce stress within our body are those self-induced pressures it's that negative self-talk and that i must i must i must do this i must i must be good enough i must and must and and i think that is something that in my journey i learned that actually that self-criticism is is you know is that comes from you know not quite achieving perfection or being a people pleaser is actually you know, it's almost like somebody else is telling you off. It's almost like somebody else is giving you a hard time and you're doing it to yourself. And so even if you can just catch yourself doing that and stop yourself doing it, that's a, that's a, was a huge step forward, certainly for, for me. So, and it was, I think one of the things we, we at, the, at the conference again was when uh, Dr. Dave Clark from um, the States was talking about how we get these personality traits, why we become people pleasers and how sometimes that can be set up from, um, you know, challenging situations in our early childhood. And I found that very fascinating. And then, then like you say, we become the, these personality or we, we adopt these personality traits. I shouldn't say we become these personality traits because actually we don't. We Part of us is a people pleaser. So I think... Um, I and think it's, not, it's not a bad, it's not a bad no. thing. No, I mean, but, it's great when I manage it in my clinic. It's a good one to have, but it's it's what we've learned that keeps us safe, isn't it? In earlier yeah. day, earlier days, all of these, yes, all exactly. of these things, all put us on high alert. You know, we in a scenario mm -hmm. where, um, you know, we've we've kind of felt that we've got to watch the situation. We've got to manage our behaviour to make sure we don't upset the apple cart and things. And I think that is again that we then can carry that through. Our lives but that would be something certainly that if you worked with a certain practitioner they would um, very gently look into and, and see if you needed if you needed to explore it and whether that was part of your picture um thank you laura for the comment it says i recognize many of these traits in myself and have had i'm having many of the symptoms pippa mentioned i'm so sorry that you are but i promise you 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 know there's there's hope you can recover um, and, and she says, this has been very enlightening. Thank you. So thank you very much for your comment. Um, as I say, we, we, we just, 
I don't know, certainly when Tanya and I talk, we just chat. And um, we try and do that in a way that um, is approachable. And, uh, you know, if you want to get in touch and chat with us more afterwards uh, or another practitioner, there are um, lots listed on the SERPA um, page, www.serpa.org. Um, and there's lots more information there too, um, because it's, you know, sometimes this might be the first... <coughs> sort of exploration of your journey it might be the, your first point of call and um there you know there are different practitioners who work in different ways and you know the the, the evidence-based knowledge and learning is the same across the board but people bring it in different ways and part of it's about personality personally about you know the practitioner that you get on with so always do feel free to have a look on the serpa site as i say for success stories and and if you want to engage with a practitioner many 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 of them have a free <clears throat> um, discovery call a free, free first um, appointment where you can just get some more information and find out if that's somebody that you'd like to work with or whether you're going to get on with them so I'm just wondering whether Laura whether you've read um, Geordie Oldfield's book your key to chronic pain your was it chronic oh, pain, pain your key to recovery it. sorry yeah. Georgie got it <laughs> <laughs> we're going to get another smiley face for that it's a really good place to start it's brilliant. Um, I would usually start. recommend that you've read that book before you, you come to us because you're saving yourself a lot of um, time and energy and money if you read the book first. She's She has. She's she's ahead of the game, Laura. She's, she's, <laughs> she's all good. Uh, <coughs> but hopefully maybe somebody else on the call hasn't and that, that may be a, a, a nudge for them to maybe explore that. So, uh, um, right, we've got, yeah, about nine minutes left. So, um, well, we're usually quite chatty. I'm sure we can fill this. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Is there, what would be your go-to? What would be your go-to, Tanya, technique for you know if you're feeling if your pain's rising? Where would you go first with that? What What would you explore first? Um, first, um, and this is what I say. I do recommend patients actually. Is like that's interesting. <laughs> is the first one does that make sense why have i got that coming up and um so that would be my first one um acknowledge it oh okay you want to come for a walk pain in my backside we're going for a walk um not to poke it um just let it be there really i guess yeah uh, me and also ask myself does that make sense um with what i know about my stresses, my pressures on myself. I take it as an alarm. Um, what's going on, Tanya? Yeah, it's it's my me it's my body giving me a little message. Something it's interesting, is not it? Imbalance. Yeah, it, but it's interesting that it's an alarm, like an alarm that would wake you up in the morning, rather than a you know great big blazing siren going. This is dangerous. This is dangerous. It's like, hmm, I'm going to just look at that with curiosity and see what it's trying to tell me. I saw on one of the Facebook groups the other day, or a brilliant, someone um, told us a story about how she was um, driving her car and there's a problem with um, one of the alert lights in the car. And she would, every, so, every few miles, she would have to stop and check that everything was okay. And it was, so then she would keep driving and then she would stop and then keep driving because it kept going wrong. And she likened that to her pain is that she didn't have to keep checking in. She didn't, there wasn't anything wrong. It was just the alarm was being too sensitive. And I really enjoyed that. I thought that was brilliant. And it really helped her with her own pain. Yeah, yeah, no, that's brilliant. <clears throat> yes, I think I think it's, um, I. one of the things I like is that real kind of just um, feeling into uh, the pain and just trying to feel, you know, what, what possibly the emotion is that's, uh, a, attached to that if that makes sense and I think that for me is always quite an, an enlightening exercise to do really just feeling into it and actually just saying well how does that make me feel and, and and that I find really helpful to sometimes as I say bring from my whatever the subconscious worry is into the consciousness so I can go oh god I didn't even know that that's what I was worried about and then then like you say you're empowered to be able to to change it so mm. I think sometimes we haven't, we can't even, well, for me, I can't even figure out exactly what it was. <laughs> no, but, but that doesn't matter, does it? No. It doesn't actually matter if you can't always connect a particular niggle that you're having with 
with whatever might have caused it. But as long as you're like not taking note of the alarm system and going, well, that's OK. It's OK. I know it'll pass. And um, usually it does. And if it's more persistent, then you might have a, a bigger message about what it's about. Yes, and I think when we talk about this, I mean, we also should say that actually if you've got a new pain that is very new and it's very persistent and you're feeling very unwell with it, you know, you, it is, you do need to get that checked out. I think, you know, sometimes we're so in, the, in this world that we forget that bit. You know, they're, they're, we do need to rule out anything else going on. And, but probably 99% of the time, actually, that, that get, can be done. And actually, often by the time people come to us, it has been done already because people have been in pain for a long time and they've had lots and lots of tests and they've been told that there's nothing wrong. Um, well, we know that there is something wrong, but it's fixable. It's just that their nervous system is, as I say, operating on a high alert system and, and producing pain. But as I say, you know, we always recommend that people do, if you have any concerns about um, a situation or change in symptoms and that you're feeling unwell, that you do want to get those, you know, you do want to get those checked out. Well, I say to my patients, if you're not sure whether I can help, give me give me a shout. Yeah, we can we can chat through it. Yeah, um, and if someone doesn't want to see you because they think you need to be checked out somewhere else, then they'll tell you. Yeah, absolutely. Now, a couple more minutes, folks. Last questions, last queries, last comments, and uh, then we'll leave you in peace. <laughs> see, we've obviously given them so much information, Pippa. <laughs> There's no room for manoeuvre. <laughs> or oh, that the donkey has lost its hind legs now because we've talked them off so much. It <laughs> can't get to the keyboard to, to, to put the title next question. So. Uh, thank you very much, Tamsin, um, for your message. She's, uh, she said thank you very much and she'd enjoyed the session. So You're I welcome. sound a bit self-congratulatory and I'm not meaning to sound that. It's just that Tanya can't see the questions. So I <laughs> need to pass them. I might add my own question. I might add my own um my own comment to Tanya to say thank you very much for this, Tanya. I always enjoy doing these with you. We have a lot well, of Well, likewise, I will add my comment. It's always yeah. a pleasure to chat with you, Pippa. You're such a I'm... professional. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I'm about that. Because this is the second video interview that uh, you've done this week. <laughs> it, it is. It is this, yes. It's not normal to be absolutely fair. So we've had one more comment from Susan who says, um, thank you. have read John Sarno, but we'll read George's book. I, we do recommend George's book, actually. It's a really, um, it's a really clear um, book. It goes through it in, in a really sort of um, really well presented, a really good language. It's not a difficult book to read at all. And it brings things in sort of bite-sized pieces and gives you the tools and techniques. And of course, if you visit the um, the SERPA site, there is also an online recovery program on there if you don't want to specifically work with a practitioner. So there are all sorts of options. So. I think the Sano, the Sano books are good, um, but there are more update up-to-date books now. And some of the thinking in the Sano books has changed, hasn't it? Yes, I think it's, and also the, lang the, the, yeah, the language and the understanding is, is, is a little bit uh, dated, um, but, it, but it's still, it's useful. But yeah, I'd start with Georgie's book, definitely. Um, yeah. Thank you, Lizzie, for your comment that says thank you, always interesting. Um, well, it's, uh, it's always a pleasure. And actually, well, if you, I mean, you know, if you want to see us again here, you know, sign up for another practitioner chat in the <laughs> month. It might not be us, but, you know, you can always make a request. You know, we could, we could do requests. Yeah, we do requests. <laughs> we sing, but we're not going to do that today. So you're okay. So. Yeah, we like to sing. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. Excellent. And, and interesting enough, just on that final point, actually, one of the things is with pain is that actually joy is the antidote to pain and play is so important and and if you know if you did nothing else today for your nervous system other than find some joy maybe by watching a funny video or playing with your kids or dancing in the kitchen then yeah try and find some joy every day and we do we we because we had a um, a SERPA practitioner CPD weekend didn't we in June and um we did have some joy. I put a pink wig on and we all had a bit of a dance. And just because, you know, it's it's so important to remember, we've got to bring balance. We need to indulge that inner child and play a bit. Maybe we should do our next chat on that. Maybe we should. Maybe we should have an Can hour. I wear my pink wig? <laughs> you can wear a pink wig. I don't, I do, I don't, I do the singing. I don't do the dressing up. Um, <laughs> we could maybe have a, yes, we could have a, a, a fun games, a joyous hour sometime in the future.
Yes, because it's not it's not all about serious. It is actually it, seriously. You need to be having fun as well. Yeah. One yeah. one of my clients went off and just she said I'm going to buy an ice. She bought an ice cream on the way home, just because I told her to indulge her in a child. Absolutely, absolutely, definitely, definitely. You want to go and have a play with your inner child and do something really, really naughty. <laughs> the other day we were out walking and we'd been out walking for about. 10 miles and our feet were really sore but we heard a train coming and the steam train was coming as we ran to the bridge <laughs> and the train tooted oh my god we were just joy absolute joy so yes wow. we're, at, we're at the end of our we're hour, done here. folks we're done and it's been a, it's oh. been lovely to have you here and thank you we've very had much. a lovely time haven't we pippa we have had a lovely time and, and tamsin says she has a friend who does laughter yoga and loves it Absolutely. Oh, fabulous. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Nearly as good as yoga. And on that <laughs> note, I will leave you to it. And it's been really lovely. And thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Cheerio. Bye.